Hi guys, I've just been interviewed by UK Investor Magazine. As we well know, there is a pending looming recession and I've been talking in my podcast, my YouTube, that um, Richard Hamilton in the art market is definitely a place for people to consider safeguarding their money as well as making a profit from. UK Investor saw this, reached out to us and rather than me interviewing someone, which I typically do, I've got the chance to be the interviewee and express a bit more about Woodbury House, our vision of our company, and more importantly, where we believe the market's gonna go. So I hope you find this interview very, very exciting, useful, and educational. If you've seen this on Instagram, please go over to the YouTube channel and watch the full version. And if you get a chance, leave a comment, leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. And eventually, when you can, book an appointment, come down to our studio. We'd like to meet you face to face. Be happy, never content. So today we're at the Woodbury House Art Studio with Steve Sully, who is the co-founder mm -hmm. of uh, Woodbury House. So we're here to discuss the art market and in particular what Woodbury House themselves are doing and the trends uh, in the art market for 2020. So. Steve, could you give us a brief history of Woodbury House and how you find yourselves here today? Yeah, so um, I've said this story multiple times, but um, found me and my business partner found ourselves by chance getting into it. Um, we personally didn't have a, a sort of plan to get into the art market. Our background is in sales and marketing, so we have marketing um, companies and a very art, a large art dealer via a mutual friend of ours approached us. He is one of the largest art dealers in, in street art in the world, very successful person. And he basically was quizzing us about what we'd done. And he kind of, in, in, in some roundabout way, didn't kind of believe how we went about doing business because in his world it's completely different. It's a lot of face to face and stuff like that. So anyway, he said to us, look, I represent a few key artists. One of them is called Richard Hambleton. I said, okay. And he said, um, I've got some entry point um, pieces, original pieces. If I give you these pieces, a big inventory, let's see if you can sell it for me. I said, okay, I'll give it a go. I watched the trailer to the Shadow Man documentary. And that is his film that was re released a few years ago. It's now on Amazon Prime. And I fell in love with the story. Gave it to the sales uh, team. They also fell in love with the story. They'd, they'd done their own research. And within about six, seven weeks, we had sold a whole entire lot of the inventory. And basically, he turned around to us and went, bloody hell, boys, you've, you've, you've got a business here. Why don't you set up a company and I'll mentor you through the process? So with that, we set up Woodbury House. And our first show that we did was in 2015 in Dubai with a restaurant called La Catina de Fabois. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were one of the only companies ever in history to take Richard Hamilton original artwork to the UAE and it was an ab absolute success. Um, a little bit of background on, on the restaurant, they've got their first original re restaurant in uh, Paris and I don't know this for a fact but the rumour has it that they sell more artwork in their restaurant gallery, because it's like a restaurant gallery in there, than any other gallery combined in the whole of Paris in, in one year. So very, very successful brand. They took it to Dubai to replicate that, that kind of film. We were one of the first companies to go over there and do, do a show. It was absolutely blinding. Um, we, we sold, obviously, some, some pieces. Uh, we got into some major publications over there. And then they invited me onto Dubai Eye, the biggest financial radio station, which I've got to be honest, I was you know, very nervous. Mm. Um, I was fairly new to the art market anyway. But we had a passion, we had a belief. We wanted to do things slightly different to the conventional way of you know, the art, how the art market operates. And we just ran with it. A year later, we'd done a show in Mexico City uh, with a really established gallery there called LS Galleria via a good friend of ours called, a guy called Jose, who's very well connected, got a very large family in, in, um, in, in Mexico. That also was a huge success. We had, we bought you know, Andy Warhol pieces there, Barry McGee, Sage Vaughan, another artist that we've represented before. Richard Hamilton, of course. Uh, Jeff Coons, we had a lot of blue chip art. That also put us on the map because Forbes, obviously you heard of Forbes, they've done a big write up of, of us, which was never planned, uh, which was amazing because as soon as you see someone like Forbes do a write up of, of you, we didn't pay for it, it wasn't a PR sort of stunt, they literally wrote a, a, an article about us. It took our brand from here up to here 
and then we got to start getting a lot of inquiries and then many years after that <clears throat> we've done a few shows here in in, in our private studio uh, we've done the collaborations and we've ended up getting into Vogue as I mentioned Forbes GQ Huffington Post Wall Street International even the standard and, and basically from you know a couple of guys that had no real sort of background in art and no let's say let's say the typical qualification you know what we just got passionate we had a bit of guidance we obviously made some mistakes along the way it's, it's, a, it's a given um, but we will learn from their mistakes and now I feel like we've got a fairly good brand and the plans that we've got now for the future we're gonna have an online shop we're gonna be doing um, we're gonna be working with some uh, emerging artists as well we're gonna do collaborations we're gonna do merchandise we're gonna do collectibles but then all, always in the background our bread, bread and butter will be the investment grade art which is predominantly Richard Hamilton Okay, so you, you mentioned there Richard uh, Hamilton, and, and that's something uh, that I want to focus on for a minute because uh, you you mentioned before we started recording that he has been your most successful artist yeah. in terms of the pieces that your investors have invested in. Mm -hmm. What do the sort of um, uh, the returns look like? through some of the pieces. Have you, have you got any particular pieces that you can give uh, investors an idea so they can sort of visualize where that piece has come from, uh, you know, what uh, was particularly unique about it, and then, you know, how that progressed through to uh, being sold down the line at some point? Yeah, so I would say um, if someone's coming into the, the market for the first time, or they're, they're let's say, a, a passive art collector or investor, they typically would buy what I call the bread and butter of Hamilton Works, which is uh, Shadowheads. Um, a bit of background about the Shadow Men or Shadowheads. He got his inspiration from the, 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 the kind of unsettled scene in New York back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of crime, drugs, prostitution, there was gangs, there was violence, there was shootings, and all of that factored into his art. And what he done when he went from the streets of New York onto canvas, he would make smaller pieces, which is basically shoulder height, and it would be the Shadowheads. In actual fact, just behind the cameraman now is, is uh, one of the Shadowheads. When we st first started selling them, we were selling probably between about four to 8,000, depending mm. on size, year, quality, etc. Those same heads today are selling between 40, 50, 60,000. I've actually seen one gallery, uh, actually in London, advertise them for up to 80,000 now. Now, even if you went conservative and you bought one for five or six grand and you were now selling it on the open market for 45, 50,000, which is very, very common, um, pretty good return. That's the kind of entry level, the higher end of the market. Um, I've sold pieces over 600,000. Um, there, there, there are auctions to demonstrate that pieces are going now for 550,000 in Phillips, which only happened last year. and and. Even though that was a wonderful piece, it was a blue wave uh, painting, very similar to that, that work down there, landscape, but it was bigger blue. Um, it was from 1985, which is prime year to collect Hamilton's work, but it's not necessarily the most recognizable piece from Hamilton. Something like that, which is a standing shadow man, is more iconic. But what I'm trying to get at is even the pieces which are deemed less kind of in the public domain on the public eye as far as his iconic works are concerned they're fitting 550,000 now and this is only the beginning I kid you not this is only the beginning there's no guarantees but history re will, will repeat itself and his predecessors you know Jean-Michel Basquet one of his pieces in 1984 what's that 30 odd years ago uh, got sold in auction for uh, $19,000 in 2017 that same piece come up in auction it got sold for 110.5 million dollars now if i told you back then buy a piece for nineteen thousand dollars because you're going to sell it 2017 for 110.5 million what would you honestly say mm. say steve you what are you smoking you mm. know you're it's crazy you know it's too good to be true well that's happened and what many art experts critics art lovers fans of hamilton work or people just immersed in the art market they're, they're saying hamilton's going to be next and um I think, you know, if you look at Subbis, Phillips, Christie's, Bonhams, they're all proving that it, it keeps them going up every single year. So, so are investors at this, <coughs> this point, they're sort of looking maybe get, to get into the, the art market. Do you think the, uh, you know, which strategy do you think would be the, the most effective looking for the next Richard Hamilton or 
taking um, pieces from Richard Hamilton um, at the higher levels in the expectation of the next leg up or do you think sort of trying to find the, the next artist which one do you think would be the most consistent way um, of, of seeing a return from that I think really good question I think or a good, good comparison which a lot of people can relate to is a bit like property so Jean-Michel Basquiat Keith Haring Andy Warhol Picasso's that is almost like buying property in Chelsea or Mayfair you know glamorous prop- properties phenomenal but you're in the heart of London it's going to cost you an absolute bomb in order to, mm. to buy one of these properties would I say personally it's a great investment for a first time property investor to buy in heart of Mayfair it depends on their scenario, mm. but for me, you, you're, going to be, you're going to be buying something very expensive in the hope that it's going to get even more expensive as time goes on. For me, that could be a little bit risky. Now, if you buy in the suburbs of London, you know, uh, maybe you know, in, in different, in different uh, counties and stuff, you know, which is a stone throw away from London, you know, a 45 minute train journey, for example, um, those are the next areas, I believe, as, as the population moves out a bit, they're going to start rising up. So how does that relate to, 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 to the art market? Well, ha- Hamilton is kind of like, you know, let's say it was a property in, in the suburbs. It's now getting that injection of capital, which has been needed to start pushing up his market. Supply and demand's come into the, the equation. You know, he's not painting no more, so therefore there's the, the demand. There's financial interests from large galleries, art agencies, art dealers who have put so much time and effort, including us, into his market that they must make sure it goes up. So I think he's definitely undervalued, and I think that I've done a few uh, podcast stroke YouTube uh, video con- con- content recently, and I've, I, I, with my team, our team, um, and uh, we, we've discovered that there, there is a five-year window, roughly, after these artists pass away, their, their market is kind of un- undervalued, and then it suddenly just shoots up. And we're, we're, we're in about a two and a half year uh, time period into, the, you know, into that five year sort of uh, slot where Hamilton is, is, has passed away. I think the artists after that, we, look, we don't hold ourselves out to be the art experts like we know everything, because I think that's almost impossible. We've concentrated only on a few key artists from a certain genre, which is street art. We, we, we're passionate about street art, we can relate to it. Um, we're affiliated with a, a clothing company called Dark Circle, clothing streetwear company, a, a, a clothing, clothing brand. And um, when we looked at street art, it was just so us, you know, we, it, it just resonated with us. So that's why we found it, we found a passion inside sort of art dealing and, and promoting these artists. Looking at Hamilton, I believe he's going to be the next, you know, next king uh, coming out of um, the street art movement. But then after that, we're probably going to start looking more closely again at Days, a guy called Christopher Ellis, but he goes by the artist's name called Days. There's another artist who's affiliated to him called Crash. There is um, a few other key artists like LA2, who is uh, featured in a Richard Hamilton documentary, who's also a street artist. There's Out Diaz. There's, there's a few key players, um, all affiliated from the street art scene, all affiliated with each other, all created that genre, and I feel, feel they're all quite undervalued. Okay, so <coughs> what are the sort of key elements um, to a piece of art or, or, or an artist uh, that would make them undervalued at, at, at this point in time? What I mean, what should investors be looking for in terms of sort of key triggers, um, you know, key signs for an early uh, an early artist that may have not been established, but we could see that in the future. What are the sort of key early signs? Um, and what are the sort of things that you think you, an investor could do to reduce the risk? Because, you know, not, not every artist is going to have the success of Richard Hamilton. Um, so what can people do to look for to make sure they've got the best chance of, of picking uh, the, the potential next Richard Hamilton or, or, or Banksy or whatever it, it may be? So as far as an investor's concerned, because I, I ask clients, collectors, uh, buyers, this same question, are you buying it for the sheer love and look and passion of it, or are you buying it to invest and make money or safeguard your money in this downturn, or is it a bit of a mixture? If we're just talking about the financial gains point of view, uh, to mitigate any kind of risk, because everything's got a risk attached to it, you could have even the best artist in the world that has ticked every single box and you can still lose money. So don't get it confused, there's no such thing as a guarantee. 
However, how you can minimise it and how you can almost get a, a fairly sure sort of understanding where it's going to go is by three questions. Number one is the artist backed by a recognised gallery. Number two is the artist backed by a recognised art dealer, art family, art collector. Number three is it backed by a recognised art muse uh, museum. And I think that if you've got the answer to all three, you've got quite a solid, sure kind of investment um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. If it's two, if it's one, it obviously gets diluted. Yeah. Now, people have made money from artists that have never been in any of those things. And, you know, overnight almost, it looks like they've gone from nothing to, to somebody. Zero to hero, as people mm -hmm. say. Um, and that can happen. And I think with the, with the era of the internet, social media especially, the benefit that we've got now is we can push artists whether that's fashion artists, whether that is canvas, sculptures, uh, people that do uh, sculptures, um, music artists, people can get founded literally from the internet. I mean, we've all heard the, the fascinating story about Justin Bieber got picked up by Usher and now he's you know, turned into a household name. Mm -hmm. um, artists can be very, very similar to that. But I think rather than getting too excited immediately and they're suddenly buying it, you know, just, just because you got so excited by, by, by the way it looks, do your research, number one, but number two, look at, are they backed by a recognised gallery? Are they backed by a recognised art collector, dealer, family? Or are they backed by a recognised uh, museum? And I think if you've got all three, um, again, look at your own finances. Obviously, don't stretch yourself, but if you are in a position, it might be something to consider. Okay, so in terms of the trends that you're seeing at the moment, there's, there's obviously a, a broad church of street arts. I mean, within that, what are the sort of key trends that you that you're seeing that are, you know, firstly producing the uh, the biggest returns at the moment, but also ones that you're starting to see maybe at the grassroots of art becoming um, a, a, a sort of new uh, potential um, theme within street art. So. Um Street art, so the way I'm going to answer that is this. My, my mentor used to say to me, if you're ever going to buy into art, try and buy the people that created the movement in their genre. So for example, um, there was a movement many years ago called Modern Art. It's obviously still around, but it's not, there isn't any more sort of being produced. Um, the main person that started that movement was Picasso. Everyone knows who Picasso is, very, very famous artist. I think he must be in the top three most searched artists in the world. Mm. Had we bought a Picasso many years ago when he was undervalued, today those pieces are worth an absolute fortune and you and I could retire off to the sunset and also we could retire you know, our kids off into mm. the sunset because the amount of money they're worth now. The movement after that was pop art. There's a few people that started that movement. Um, I would say the most common one uh, people reference is Andy Warhol. Uh, again, had we bought an Andy Warhol, we'd be absolutely laughing today. The movement after that, which was quite affiliated to pop art, is street art. You had three main guys that started it, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Harry, and Richard Hamilton. The International Herald Tribune, which is a, a New York paper, in 1983 wrote an article about there's a new wave and love for street art. They said if you were to buy a, a, a Jean-Michel Basquiat back then in 1983, you would be paying about $10,000. If you were to acquire a Richard Hamilton or a Haring, you'd be paying 15000 And out of the three, the only one they chose to reference was Richard Hamilton's uh, Standing Shadow Man. Uh, the irony today is Jean-Michel Basquiat has gone to $110.5 million, even though he was the least kind of recognised, least collected one out of the, out the three. Um, and then Haring's work, you can be expected to pay 10, 20 million upwards for one of his good masterpieces. Um, one of the reasons why Hamilton hasn't got to that level is for two factors. One, he didn't conform with the art market. He didn't do things for fame, money. Uh, he didn't do it to be cool. He he done it. He, he painted just to for the sheer love of being an artist, and that's why so many people adore, adored him. The second point, um, he didn't die. <laughs> you know, the best career move, unfortunately, uh, which is reality, um, uh, what a, uh, an artist can make is when they part, pass away and when they pop their clogs. Now, with that in being said, um, street, street art is kind of a pocket inside a bigger movement, which is above it, which is contemporary art. Now, contemporary art wavers over street art. There's also other references like urban art, uh, contemporary street art. You know, there's, there's a couple of different variations of that. You've also got artists who are living today who are doing some absolutely amazing things. Obviously, Banksy is one of them, but then you've got Jeff Koons, you've got Damien Hirsch, you've got Cause, and these are, this is kind of like a new wave of artists. Um, 
I'm not, they're fantastic artists, but they direct a lot of the time as well. They do mm. some, they do stunts, they do kind of crazy models, they do sculptures, they do toys. And you, we are seeing a lot of the younger demographic collect those because they're cool, quite funky, and they're fetching some very, very huge auction results. So okay. yeah, they're, they're the kind of people to look out for. Okay, too. so the, the street art is, is fitting in more into a broader church again of contemporary art. I mean, is there, you mentioned there back in 1983, uh, first references were starting to be made to uh, street art, and here we are 30 years later. What are you sort of seeing at the moment, which could be the next street art, which is at this very, uh, very much its infancy at the moment, uh, which which falls within that broader church of contemporary art that could possibly have the same sort of trajectory as street art did from sort of 1983 up to where we are now. You know, it's it's hard to tell where the market's going to go, but I can't see. I mean, look, if you if I were to ask you right now, who's the top two or three artists that pop into your brain, even if you've got no art background, you're going to definitely say in there Banksy, yeah. and people adore Banksy. One because how creative he is. Two because he's elusive, and and three like, remember it was only last year I believe where someone bought a piece uh, in auction and then suddenly he got shredded in half. Yeah, you know them kind of stunts is. People like experiences now. It's not just about buying art, it's about the experience. Part of what we do here at Woodbury House, we want to give people an experience. And also a chance for people that may not have 50 grand, 100 grand, 200 grand to buy an original piece, but want to buy a part of Richard Hamilton's history. We do collaborations, we do mer merchandise collectibles, and they can own that as something to put away in maybe in years, years, a few years time. That also could be worth a bit of money. But going back to your question, uh, you know, there are a lot of street artists today who are fairly young, who are making a name for themselves. I had a, uh, a guy on my podcast called Nathan Bowen, who's done some fantastic stuff in suburbs of London, also in the heart of London. Um, he's really been a big supporter, supporter of the NHS as well during this kind of COVID time, which is, I think is fantastic. There's another artist that I personally really adore, very, very simple, which is called Stick, S-T-I-K. Um, also, he was homeless and he used to paint predominantly streets of uh, shortage. He's also done some murals for the NHS. And basically, I think he uses six kind of pencil-like uh, sort of uh, like outline of a, of a figure to make this kind of stick human. And um, fantastic stuff. But now his, his pieces are fetching a good amount of money in, in, um, in auction. I actually asked him, um, I think back in the last year, how much would a commission piece you know, cost me? He said, you're looking probably minimum about 40,000. Now I remember those pieces, you know, only a few years ago were less than 10,000. So that, that gives you a bit of a gauge how, how under demand people like he, he is now. And I would say this, Banksy, people like Stick, people like any of these modern street artists, a lot of them will know who Hamilton is and many of them would say that Hamilton gave them the inspiration, motivation and a slight education or a mentorship from afar to go off for them to go off and, and, and craft and shape their own kind of career. Okay, so you, you mentioned the COVID-19. Uh, how have you found the art market and in particular how is Woodbury House found the, the art market <coughs> during COVID-19. What, what's that been looking like? Um, part of it is frustrating, part of it is fantastic, and I'll tell you why. The frustrating thing is the experiences. Um, we wanna, we don't, we're not a brand which just says, buy a bit of art, thank you, and that's it. We like to get their pieces into major publications, you know, the Forbes, the Huffington Post, the Wall Street Internationals, you know, the, the you know, any, any of the, prime uh, publications to build up the profile. We also like to make content around it, so we do YouTube videos, we might talk to, to do a podcast on it. We also then put them into shows, and the clients who've invested into that piece, bought that piece, would like to come along, you know, be a part of the show, bring their friends along, you know, and, and it's really quite a nice experience, and it, it, it's just fun, and it just feels nice. Um, that part of it's completely come to a halt. But the other side of it, um, which is the, let's say, art trading, um, I've got to tell you, it's flourishing because right now the stock market is down. You've got the interest rates, as far as the Bank of England's concerned, have brought them down again. 
and we are still seeing historic lows of interest rates and that means people in theory are losing money because the inflation rate compared to interest you know their money is eroding away every single day and no matter what they say to themselves that's a fact they're losing money in the bank um, also people a little bit still battered and bruised from the 2008 downturn the you know the subprime mortgage lending scenario where we had this great almost this depression and, and people are a little bit fearful if we go into a bigger aggressive slump with this COVID-19 scenario who knows another bank could go under it's quite possible we never believed that Lehman Brothers were going to go under back then but they did Bradford and Bingley Northern Rock there's so many examples of that so people now are becoming a lot more open-minded and they want to look at other areas not necessarily to make loads of money um, a friend of mine used to say this to me, every pound saved is like a pound made in a recession. So what people now are doing is looking to park their money in other places. I think people are telling me about classic cars. Some of them are going up quite well. You mentioned fine wine. I know certain Bordeaux fine wines from certain, certain chateaus are going up. And then definitely art. Art is definitely a place. Now, art is very, very broad. You've got to narrow it down to certain genres, I believe, because certain genres are not going to do so well. And other genres, such as... Uh, street art and, and, and specifically Hamilton is thriving. I think Hamilton's thriving because there is a kind of a recession or a looming recession so people are looking for other places to put their money. Hamilton has just died in the last couple of years so people's, people are waking up to the fact that he's not going to paint anymore and the urgency is kicking in. That's driving things up and I think street art anyway is just such a popular area at the moment. Rappers are talking about it, singers are singing about it People are producing songs around certain street artists and also the culture of it. Um, even street food and street art and street, you know, everything. It, it all kind of combines under this kind of movement and this kind of culture. And it go, it's going off of the, uh, one of your previous mm. questions. I think it's here to stay and I think it's only going to grow, grow, grow stronger. I can't see it slowing down. Um, so, yeah, I think, I hope that sort of answer, answers your question now. Okay, so... Just to sort of wrap things up, if somebody's uh, listening to this and they're thinking about, yeah, this, this sounds like, uh, you know, a potential um, choice for them in terms of their portfolio, but they are a little bit sceptical because uh, I don't have the experience there. Um, what would you say are the biggest pitfalls to try and avoid when investing in art or starting an art collection what what are the things that um, really do hurt returns over the long term because they make mistakes at the beginning which, which what are things to people to avoid to uh, to kick off their art portfolio um, I'd reference it very similar to, to property again because I've got a bit of pa passion for property as well and I think when I first got into property the mentor I had said don't use a sc scatter gun, gun approach and I said what do you mean he said well try and buy a property in London, try and buy a property in Manchester, try and buy something in Newcastle, then try and buy something in Kent. He said, because you won't get to know the area. And I thought that was really good advice. And I stuck at one area and kind of sort of learnt that area first. And then once you've got confidence and a bit of expertise, then you can venture into other sides. And I think that that um, education then, a bit of advice, is transferable into art to a certain level. I think if you can look at a certain genre, get to know it inside out and become as far as, as close as you can to an expert as humanly possible. You're always going to learn, so there's no such thing as a complete expert, but very, very au fait with that market. I think you're going to know the risks as well as, as, well as the upsides. If you learn 20% of modern art, 20% of pop art, 20% of street art, you probably know enough to feel confident to buy, but you don't know enough to know the, the downsides. I think when you get 100% knowledge or as close as you can in one sector, you can mitigate your risk. And also, if you're buying up for the first time, listen, I'm in sales and I'm in marketing and I will stand by salespeople to the day I die because without sales, nothing happens. The world doesn't turn. You could have the best brand, the best, best invention in the world, the best uh, company, the best idea, but nothing happens to that idea unless you've got someone selling it for you or unless you've got a sales sort of formula and system but let's be fair anyone can you know if someone I could bring up a new artist tomorrow and tell you all the glorious stuff about them but I won't, they might not necessarily tell you about the downsides yeah. so before you get too excited and just buy something do your own research you know just do your own research go and visit um, 
go and visit the, 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 the studio, go and visit the gallery, go and visit the art dealer and, and really get to know them as, as you know, from, uh, from, a, from a personal point of view. Over time, as you start to build up a collection, then, you know, some of our clients now, they live on the other side of the world. They don't, they don't have a chance to come here. But we either try and do a Zoom call with them, uh, we get them try and get hit them here once, or we go and visit them at their own property or their business or whatever, or we invite them to our shows and, you know, we get them to follow us on social media so they become familiar with us. And then over time that trust, you know, is there. So I would say do your own research um, and definitely learn a genre, learn the ups as well as the downs, and then you'll be a lot more informed to, to, to decide whether this is for you or not for you. Okay, fantastic. So you, met, you mentioned there um, social media, but what's uh, the best way people to get in touch with you if they've got further questions? Um, so we are in Soho in Archer Street. So this is our UK presence. Um, the company's actually formed in Dubai with our director over there. Um, but if you're over here, uh, Archer Street, you can actually contact us on uh, Woodbury House, um, the Instagram or our website, um, yeah, just like many brands, we've got the whole sort of social media channels. Okay, fantastic. Cool. Well, Steve, thank you very much for today. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Thank you. So these are our, our publications that we've been featured in. So you've got Vogue, you've got Forbes, as I mentioned, you've got GQ, New Collection, um, Hype Beast. This one was a really cool one for us, as well as Vogue, um, because these are predominantly lifestyle uh, publications, but what I was trying to demonstrate in our in our conversation earlier is art, especially street art, is venturing into fashion, is venturing into a lifestyle kind of um, culture. Obviously, it's going into music, food, that kind of thing. So when Vogue, which is known for its fashion, but then Hype Beast picked us up, it's major, and we actually start getting more uh, a different demographic. Mm -hmm. So it's not just your typical collectors. Um, or investors, you are now getting a younger demographic who like street art but may not be able to afford it just yet so they're buying the t-shirts, the merchandise, the collectibles but eventually they will start going into you know buying buying canvas work for themselves. Okay. So that was really really cool for us. The gallery side of of the uh, of, of the studio, we've had some pieces in from New York recently so I kind of like this one here. This is a, uh, a shadow cat from the 1980s um, one of our clients had just purchased this. There's a big demand at the moment for street art from the 80s, whether that's from uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Richard Hamilton, or any, any of the, the, the greats. Um, and we're finding that no matter whether it's a shadow cat, a landscape, a, a standing shadow man, uh, or anything like that, or a rodeo, that they want to collect it because it's original, it's canvas from Hamilton, it's also from the 80s. Okay. We just had this one in, uh, which is a landscape. Now, if you've watched the, stand, um, the Shadow Man film, um, that, that particular piece was uh, featured in the trailer. Um, I know this is gonna sound quite uh, gory, but Richard Hamilton, sadly, was a drug user. And I'm not just talking about a bit of weed and uh, a, yeah. a bit of you know, alcohol, mm. I'm talking about hard drugs, crack, cocaine, and heroin. And when he's take heroin, he used to obviously draw back on the needle and inside that hypodermis came this almost cloudy red kind of landscape and that's what that kind of resembles. Um, so a lot of uh, collectors who um, buy into certain works, they sometimes ask about what kind of state the artist was in because sometimes their best sort of artwork is when they were slightly intoxicated or, or affiliated with, with drugs. That was also in the Giorgio Armani, uh, Giorgio Armani show. So when Richard Hamilton's career got resurrected uh, back in like 2009 and 10, there was five shows around the world done with Giorgio Armani. Giorgio Armani gave them a platform and that was featured in it. So our collector just purchased this. It came all the way from New York. It's got great providence, great history, and it's, and it's really fantastic. What I want to talk to you about though is you asked me about this one earlier. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you a little story about this. So um, I've got a, a couple of, um, let's say, negotiants or art dealers. In actual fact, there's another guy called Steve who live in America and we were uh, getting some shadow heads off of him. Shadow heads are like ones up here, which I mentioned that we were selling them back six, seven years ago for about four to 8,000. Now they're fetching 40, 50, 60,000 up. Um, I was buying some of these off of him a few years ago and he said to me, Steve, I've got this Richard Hamilton box. 
And that's a box. So he said, yeah, um, I've got this box. It's so low cost. I think you should buy it. I'm not really into gimmicky stuff, Steve. I'd rather keep to the Richard Hamilton originals because that's what I know. He said, look, it's so low and it's so unique. You need to buy it. He convinced me. And anyway, as it came, as I bought it, it came over in the shipment. And I never saw it went into, into our bonded facility where a lot of our collectors, investors keep their artwork. Because yeah. most people don't want to have you know, a you know, 50 grand piece or whatever at, at home. They want to keep it in bond okay. for, for, for protection and insurance purposes. And also to keep it out of the way, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I went into the bonded facility months later, or a year and a half later in actual fact, and I came across the box. And as I opened up the box, inside of it was this standing shadow man. And it's from the 80s. Now, I've got a friend of mine who worked for a very large gallery in Mayfair who are hugely affiliated to Banksy. And I asked her, I said, look, I'm not going to tell you how much I pay for this, but um, if you were to give me a rough price, what would you say? She said, look, if you framed it right, if you put it in the right show, if you built, built up the, the profile of it, if you got the right publications involved, you know, anything north of 100,000, you could probably easily get because it's so unique. Mm. With that, I thought, great, we're just going to keep it part of our portfolio. We're never going to sell it. And we just adored it, you know, because it, 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 it hadn't been seen for so long. Anyway, my business partner last year was in Switzerland and had a very, very similar sort of thing happen to him. Um, the guy turned around to him and said, I've got these 20 boxes. Are you interested? I spoke to my business partner and said, look, if you open them all up, if they're them inside, let's get them. And I've got one of them in front of me. So basically, this is what happened. You open them up. And inside is a signed box, which is called the Nightlife. There are 53 of them out there. We own 22. And on the booklet there, it says Nightlife. And as you open it up, is these Richard Hamilton original works that all fold out. And the unique thing about these, they're signed on the sort of pamphlet. They're signed on the box, so you've got a double signature. They're original from the 80s. And here's the thing, what is Hamilton known for? He's known for being a great artist, but who disappeared. These were kind of one of the first things he'd done on the streets of New York and then converted it onto this paper and then folded away and they yeah. disappeared for about 30 years. Because of that, our investors were so intrigued by that you know, we sold about 15 immediately, one to what, 10 to one particular gentleman. And the whole idea behind these is we're gonna put them into our uh, show called The Nightlife Show. We've got a photographer coming over who knew Hamilton, a guy called Frank Palada. Um, he's gonna be talking about Hamilton's life, about why he painted in the way he painted and kind of the moods he used to change, you know, go through and things of that, of that nature. There's gonna be a live talk and that was meant to be happening on the 29th of April this year, but sadly due to Corona, that is sort of stopped. Mm. But as soon as we're allowed to do the show again and, and it's the right time, this is gonna be the main focal point for Woodbury okay. House. And when I tell you it's gonna be the biggest show that we've ever done in history, I'm not kidding. You know, we're gonna literally shake up the art market with this because the Hamilton story has been told. You know, many other galleries have jumped on it after he died, and rightly so, because it's a great story. But this narrative ha hasn't been spoken about. And what our goal is to do is try and reunite. It's almost like, you know, it's like having a brother or sister that, you know, you've lost for 20 years, 30 years, try and re reunite them. Mm. And with this show, because we, we know we're gonna get into the big publications, we believe we can, um, we can, we can get them all back together. Okay. So um, our collectors and investors, you know, they bought at a very cost-effective level. So you have the 22 that you have, display the show I'm bringing in the other ones yeah so they're all they're all in the corner over there and in boxes and yeah. um, we're gonna frame them like this gonna be a floor uh, sort of standing uh, we've got our um, we've got someone who's head of uh, sort of who creates uh, the, the show for us and he's gonna be um, He's basically going to make sure it looks very, very cool, and he's going to capture, you know, capture the audience and have get, have that real kind of experience uh, factor. Um, we're going to have some photography there for sale, which is of Hamilton's work. It's not done by Hamilton; it's the photographer taking photos okay. of, of his works. But yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we do. So going back to what we were saying earlier, we don't just sell people artwork and then they just disappear, and then that's the end of our relationship. We mm. build up their 
you know the pieces we get them into the publications and i think that's really really important okay cool cool thanks for uh, coming around the no studio problem. cool thanks for having me